Good morning and welcome to worship. We are delighted to have all of you with us this morning as we have a chance to put our hearts, our heads, our voices together to lift those up in prayer and praise to God today. Welcome to all of you. And for those of you who are joining us online this morning, our apologies for not being able to broadcast last week's service. We are at least temporarily up and running and we'll hope and trust that you get to participate in all of our worship this morning as well. A couple of announcements to share uh, before we begin. One of those is a reminder that our Sunday School youth will be gathering back in this space for opening singing starting at about 10.15. So after worship, grab some refreshments and, and come on back in here. And we have a special opportunity this morning beyond that. Andy, do you want, Andy, you want to talk about what you guys are doing? It'd be great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Angie, and as you may have seen advertised the last couple of weeks, we're going to be doing, Lisa Smith and I are going to be doing a mental health training day. It's called the Green Bandana Project in room four, starting at 1010 for Adult Forum. And we're going to be taking a look at signs and symptoms of both depression and suicide, how we can respond effectively to someone who might be struggling, and how we can get that person connected to supports and resources in the community to get them the help that they need. The high school students went through this training in the fall, and on behalf on behalf of the mental health advocacy team, we're just inviting and encouraging anyone who might be interested in learning a little bit more about mental health and how to help others to attend today. Hope to see you at 1010. Excellent. Thank you much, Angie. Our high schoolers have had a great uh, feedback from their training that they've been through, and they were really hoping that other adults would take advantage of it. So we hope that you're able to do that today. Um, with that, a couple of the rest last minute pieces, and that is that, believe it or not, we are just a few short days away from the start of the, uh, the Lenten season. It starts on the 22nd with Ash Wednesday. We'll have ashes available um, throughout the day, and we'll have worship here that evening. Um, but just a reminder, too, that part of our, at least, longer-term tradition, as it were, was to have Lenten soup suppers. And we've been uh, gracious enough to have one of our folks say, I'll bring the soup. So the soup's here, the bread's going to be here, but we're looking for folks to help serve and help maybe provide a few veggie sticks on the side. So if you'd be able to do that or willing to do that at any of the weeks during the Lenten season, uh, please let me know today, or you can talk to the church office and we'll get you scheduled and make sure that we have enough helping hands to go around. It's a great tradition, a great place to you know, you get to know folks in ways you don't always get the opportunity on Sunday mornings. We hope that you can be part of that on this year as well. Um, we have also, uh, during the, the, se- the season uh, after Ash Wednesday, uh, we have Wednesday night worship in a way that's going to have a chance for both our young uh, folks, our youth groups, to have a chance to gather with their normal small group leaders. But we also have a small group for adults as well. And so we really encourage you to come out, be part of that Wednesday night community, and join in our Lenten study together. It's a great study by Kate Bowler. Uh, it's actually based on a book being released this Tuesday on Valentine's Day. And uh, it sounds, promises to be a great addition to our, our own journey. So come and be, be part of that. We'd love to have you uh, join us for that, that, uh, that series. With that, let's stand together, if you would, as we begin with our opening song. It's a piece called I Shall Walk in the Presence of God. I shall walk in the presence of God, I shall walk in the sun and the rain upon me, I shall walk in the land of the living, living land, I shall walk with the sisters and brothers around me, I shall walk, just that easy, try to sing, I shall sing in the presence of Sun and the rain upon me, I shall sing. And in the land of the living, living land, I shall sing. With my sisters and brothers around me, I shall sing. But I shall pray. With 
the sun and the rain upon me I shall bring In the land of the living, living land I shall bring With my sisters and brothers around me I shall bring I shall dance in the presence of God I shall dance poured into our hearts the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the abundant life of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Also with you. We're singing Healer of Our Every Ill. strength of all who hope in you because we are weak mortals we accomplish nothing good without you help us to see and understand the things we ought to do and give us grace and power to do them through jesus christ our savior and lord amen, amen. we invite you to be seated and if you're one of our young folks i invite you to come and spend some time with our good friend pastor john who's going to be able to give us and bring us the word today so come on up and join them here in the front of the church if you would. Oh! <laughs> this 80-year-old body may not get up again. <laughs> 
How are we doing today? Good, good. Nice day out there, isn't it? Yeah, good. Well, I want to try a little experiment. I've got a, a mirror and a flashlight, and I thought I'd... How does that work? Huh? Do you see it? So how much light does a, a, a mirror give off? A little bit. Does it give off any light? Where did the light come from? Um, the, flashlight. the flashlight. You're right. This just reflected it, didn't it? Yeah. And, and in a way, I think we're supposed to be kind of like this mirror. Jesus said we are to be a light of the world, but we aren't the light. We receive his love as he comes and loves each and every one of us. And then as we experience that love by coming here and learning about it or in Sunday school or in our families, we share that love out with other people. We kind of reflect what God has already given to us. That's why it's so important to stop and experience God's love in our own life and then share that so we can be a light to other people. Yeah. How many times or whenever do you look in a mirror? Huh? Tons. <laughs> when do you do that? Maybe when you, like if you're like me, comb your hair? No, I no. do it every day. Every day, yes. We usually do look in the mirror, don't we? Because we like to see how good looking we are. <laughs> Yes, but I was thinking about that. As you look in a mirror and you see your reflection, you might think about how then we are to reflect God's love out to other people as well. So hopefully you always know how important you are to God and how much God loves each and every one of you. Because then you know you can share that love with others. Yeah, good idea. Shall we pray? Okay, let's pray. Father... We thank you, for you love us, and you ask us to share your love, to be your loving people, to shine that light out into the world. May these young people always know how important they are to you, and know your love always. In thy name we pray, amen. 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 <laughs> Thanks for coming up, appreciate it. Now somebody help me get up. <laughs> And we continue with our lesson for the day. The reading for this morning is from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said also, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, 
causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or for by earth, for it is, it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Word of God, word of life. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I knew there was a reason I retired. It was so I wouldn't have to deal with some of these tough sayings of Jesus, let alone write a sermon on them. So listen again to what Jesus says in our gospel, and I want to read it from a version known as the message, because I think it maybe kind of speaks more clearly to our day. For example, verse 22, I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot, and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister, and you are on the brink of hellfire. And so when you've been driving down the street or highway and somebody carelessly cuts you off, have you ever said something about that idiot? (laughs) I certainly in my driving have probably been called that idiot from time to time. Or I'm sure you've never said something like, boy, are you stupid? (laughs) Or maybe in talking with another person made that comment about somebody else, you are stupid. Never, except, well, (laughs) maybe we have. And Jesus' words were thoughtlessly yell, stupid as sister, and you are on the brink of hell fire. (laughs) Verse 23 from the message, if you enter your place of worship and are about to make an offering and suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, and Go to this friend and make things right. Don't everyone get up and leave. And don't say there hasn't been a time when you you have had a grudge against someone and you came to worship even so. (laughs) And in talking about committing adultery, the message has it these ways. But don't think you've reserved your virtue by simply staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted even quicker than your body. These leering looks... You think nobody notices, they also corrupt. And then these words, if you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to live one-eyed or else be dumped in the moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment it is raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded in the dump. Ever raise a hand against someone? (laughs) Cut it off. I get a kick out of some people who, when they disagree with your interpretation of Scripture, say something like, well, I take the Bible literally. The Bible says it. That's good enough for me but I've yet to see someone who has blinded themselves by (laughs) pulling out an eye when they have been led to sin or cut off a hand because it caused them to sin. None of us follows God's law completely as we read it in our Bibles, and even those who claim to read the Bible literally often ignore certain parts. So what is Jesus saying about our being his disciples? 
And I think, you know, we could deal with those sayings individually, dealing with murder, anger, adultery, and divorce. But I'd like to look at them as a whole and, and what Jesus may be saying. One thing certainly being taught is to help us see how utterly we are dependent upon the grace and love of God. I preached last Sunday, and last Sunday's gospel ends up For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Truth is, the Pharisees really tried to follow God's law, (laughs) to live an upright life. In fact, the Pharisees had some 600 extra laws which were meant to help them follow God's law. For example, the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, also says something about not working. And so the Pharisees, in order to follow that commandment, thought, well, what is work? And they came up with how far you could walk on the Sabbath (laughs) or how much weight you could lift on the Sabbath, really trying to follow God's law. But you see, the problem with the Pharisees and, and all their laws was eventually they got to thinking of themselves as being better than everyone else because, well, they thought they were trying harder (laughs) to follow God. Some of them actually falling into the impression they actually were following God, not like those other sinners out there. Do these Pharisees sound like any religious groups today who want to claim that they are better than others? There are those groups who want to claim they're more religious. Listen to some of them talk, and they'll infer that those Lutherans or other denominations are going to hell because they don't do this or do that. And they can even try to impose their understanding through political actions because, well, all of those other Christians are wrong. I said one of the things that Jesus is teaching us in these words, is how utterly dependent we are on the grace and love of God. Now, if you read the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul just simply writes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus and Paul are really saying the same thing. Paul saying it in a very direct way. All of us are sinners. Jesus, using that kind of Middle Eastern style of telling stories, and often using exaggeration within stories. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If you're in worship and remember a grudge between you and your friend, leave immediately and settle the grudge. Well, we aren't to take Jesus' directions here quite so literally, but to understand we don't live that perfect life. We don't follow God's law completely. and Therefore, well, in many ways, I don't know, do we deserve to have our hand cut off? Certainly deserve probably to go to hell. But that's exactly why Jesus came into our world, to help us more fully understand God's will for us and to understand how far short we fall and finally to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. In terms of the Old Testament's offering of sacrifices, to offer himself to sacrifice himself on our behalf. So rather than our getting what we deserve, we receive the promised forgiveness of sins. We receive the promised life eternal. Which is one reason many of us know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may have not perish but have eternal life. We also need to add in verse 16 or 17 that follows. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that through him the world might be saved. In other words, for God did not send his Son into the world to cut off every hand that led to sinning. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn everyone who called another a fool or stupid. God sent his Son into our world that we might be saved from our sins even though we deserve condemnation. And yet, at the same time, as disciples, we are called to live probably much better than we even 
thought we would be called. I mean, I think the Pharisees had this idea, but Jesus calls them to an even greater life than what they could even imagine. But then when we fail, we can come to God, honestly confessing our sins and receive forgiveness. I think there's a very profound thing here in our gospel. It's so easy, I think, to turn our faith into just following a bunch of laws. And we can even maybe pretend that we follow enough laws to think we're better than others. But what I notice in our gospel is that Jesus isn't really talking about breaking some law. Jesus is rather talking about how we treat others. Rather than simply calling us to follow a new law, he calls us to look at our relationships with others and how what we do affects those relationships. I mean, think about that. Our relationships matter to God. God cares about our relationships, cares deeply and passionately about how we treat each and every one because God loves each and every one of us. I mean, I notice that each of these teachings in our gospel concerns how we treat each other. It's not enough to refrain from murder. We should also treat each other with respect. And that means not saying hateful words. It's not enough to uh, physically avoid committing adultery. We should also not objectify other persons by seeing them as a means to satisfy our physical desires. It's not enough to follow the letter of the law regarding divorce. We should not treat people as disposable and should make sure that the most vulnerable, in Jesus' day that would be women and children, that such are provided for. It's not enough to keep ourselves from swearing falsely and lying to others. We should speak and act truthfully in all of our doings so that we don't need to make any oaths at all. You see what's being said here? All the exaggeration about cutting off body parts and burning in hell serve just to magnify how important our relationships are to God. And I think it's important to remember, in, in many ways, Jesus isn't saying anything new here. <laughs> I mean, you can go back way to Deuteronomy. And Moses asks the people, sets before them a choice, will these people oh, follow the laws, obey the Lord their God? Listen to Moses, how he indicates how they will obey that, by loving the Lord your God. And we know from other places in the Old Testament that loving the Lord your God included loving God your neighbor. So these laws, as Luther and other reformers so often stressed, these laws are really a precious gift given by an adoring parent to beloved children, urging them to treat each other well. In fact, I think, you know, God cares so much about our relationships with others that God would rather have us take care of Stand this way. <laughs> Don't move so much. <laughs> God cares so much about our relationships with others that God would rather have us take care of those relationships before we even come to worship him, which is how I interpret those words about leaving. You know, if you have a grudge against someone, leave before they are, even before you've given your offering. Come on, God. <laughs> which I think really leads us to stop and think about our relationships with others. I mean, think about a relationship that is important to you, one that is healthy and whole and sustains you. Think about what makes that a good relationship and about why it's so important. And stop and give thanks to God for that relationship you share. Because it can be in those relationships that we really experience God's love and God's forgiveness. But then maybe we need to call to mind another relationship that is important to us, but that has suffered some damage. And it seems so often we want to figure out who is to blame for the hurt, and let's be honest, we usually want to blame the other person for the hurt. 
But instead of that, let's seek to hold up that relationship in prayer. To offer that before God, to bring it for God in a, for healing and help. And maybe think about what action we can take to move that relationship to better health. Yes, in our gospel, we see how far short we fall of the way God calls us as his disciples to act. But God loves us and gave his life for us on that cross that though we deserve condemnation as we come to Jesus, we receive eternal life. And yet, knowing how short we fall, that's not an excuse to do nothing, <laughs> not an excuse to treat others in a bad way. But we also recognize our calling as Jesus' disciples to treat one another with respect and value. For we know that God cares about each and every relationship you have because God cares about you and every other person. Amen. Great message, John. Thanks for a reminder of just how sacred and important that grace is. We're going to join in singing our hymn of the day, which is called We Will Hold On. join in the prayers of the church.
And as we come together this morning, just a reminder of uh, several individuals certainly in need of our, our prayers this morning, uh, both within our community and certainly well beyond. Uh, we want to lift up uh, Tracy in particular, who's back with us this morning following her procedure. Good to have you here, Tracy. Also, I want to lift up Harold Meyer, who's been now moved to Care Center following his recent uh, hospitalization. So keep Harold in your prayers as well. And so with all of that, Lord, let's uh, gather our, and offer up our prayers for the church and for all we know to be in special need today, all for that matter of God's good creation itself. Let's pray. Cultivate humility in your church, O God, and in gatherings of every size, teach us to boast only in the cross. Indeed, shape your church to be a people of humility and kindness, of generosity and justice. Empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. And Lord, the foundations of the earth bear witness to your faithfulness. The mountains and the hills echo with your holiness. When we mistreat your creation, show us again the error of your ways and inspire us with reverent awe and honor all that you have made. Empowering God, grant us grace to respond in love. Jesus, you make foolish the wisdom of your world and so raise up honorable leaders who would seek justice and love mercy and pursue peace we want to pray especially again to know for peace in, in the holy land in, in between russia and ukraine and congo and rwanda we ask that you would frustrate plans that might be corrupt or, or self-serving and you'd prosper the work of peacemakers empowering god grant us your grace to respond in love god we Look at the news and our heart just breaks with the suffering going on in Turkey and Syria today. Amidst all that they face and all that they have endured, Lord, may they feel the compassion of, of the church, both locally and around the world as we gather what we can gather to support them in their ordeal, Lord. Help them, God, to, to just get the comfort that they need, the help that they need, and the support that they need to rebuild empowering God. Grant us your grace to respond in love. And then God, we ask that uh, you would be with your people who are perhaps needing help and hope today, those who are, we know, to be ailing in our midst or those who are, are recovering from recent ailments. We want to pray for John and, and for Ron and Harold. We, we lift up Tracy. We lift up Charles and Dorothy and others living with cancer. And those living with, who are again, living with assistance. We pray for those who are grieving today, whether, again, across the oceans or right in our own homes. And may the hope and the promise of your resurrection, the hope that's ours in Christ, both sustain and comfort each of them. Empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. And then, finally, God, just for all of the petitions that we may only perhaps be able to, to utter in the quiet of our hearts. Empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. And so, Lord, once again, we bring to you these, our needs and our hopes, trusting your wisdom and the power revealed in Christ crucified. In his name we pray, amen. Indeed, may the peace of the risen Lord Jesus be with you all. Let's take a moment before we continue to share a word and a sign of that peace with one another. And we invite you to be seated as we share our gifts for today and prepare to celebrate our Lord's Supper. Just a reminder that all are certainly welcome to share in the Supper, and that uh, regardless of your membership status, regardless of your denominational background, whether it may be, it's a meal of hope that we get all to be able to participate in today.
I invite you to stand as you are able as we join together in our confession and forgiveness. As we approach God, let us come in confession, trusting in the love of the crucified Christ. Holy God, with what shall we come before you? We have too often turned from your way to follow our own. Forgive us for the times when we have spoken or acted too quickly, or we have not spoken or acted at all. Forgive us for when we have hurt those closest to us, or hurt those we have yet to know. Give us grace when we have thought more about ourselves than others, and when we have thought less of ourselves than we ought. Turn us around. Give us a fresh start today that we might be reconciled to you and to one another. Amen. Even when we have done wrong, God makes us right. Even when we have messed up, God puts us together. We see once again the promise of baptism. You are God's child and your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And who gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come, receive the great gift of our Lord's body and blood. Praising my soul. 
Let's now stand together to receive the blessing. Now may you behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Renew our strength, Lord, our strength to, to do justice, to love kindness, and to journey humbly with you. Amen. Amen. We join together in singing our sending peace, which is with this bread. Love ever knowing. 
thanks for being part of our worshiping community this morning. We're great, we're grateful for your presence. A reminder, our Sunday schoolers will meet in here, 10.15 at 10.10. In room four, right behind me, is where our adults are going to meet for uh, the green bandana training. We hope you can be part of one or both of those. Who knows? Meanwhile, go in peace to love, to live, and to share Christ. Thanks be to God. God.